the Historical Society for asking me to speak tonight. It's an honor to be here in front of you. I appreciate seeing all of you. Uh, just to let you know, Judy asked me to talk for three hours. So we'll take breaks every now and again because you know, the older you get, the smaller the ladder you get. So, I so uh, uh, once again, I thank you. And uh, I do want to point out uh, uh, a couple of celebrities here tonight. I'm looking at Pat Metal, uh, Chief Metal's wife. And probably a little bit more pressure is from this guy right here, Bob Longbottom, who's with us for 17 years as the assistant chief, so um, I'm likely to get smacked around if I didn't say something. <laughs> so uh, let's, let's go ahead and get started. I, I learned quite a bit as, as um, I was researching uh, for this meeting tonight. Uh, so thank you for throwing that challenge to me, because I dug in deeper to things that I never knew. Uh, I also learned a lot of things that I really can't repeat tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and you know who you are. So, as, I, as I was doing this research, we've always heard the fire department started January 1942. But the biggest question that I've never heard asked is, what did Suffield Township do for a fire department before 1942? Does anybody have any idea? Very no. Yes, sir. And... The village of Mogador. Now these area, these fire departments in our area started here, Kent 1876, Mogador in 1927. Suffield Township entered into an agreement with the village of Mogador, effective July 3rd of 1940, for fire protection for the entire township. Brimfield started in 1934, Hartville 1935, Randolph started in 1940, and April 28th of 41, I have to put little notes on there so I can see what I'm doing. Uh, April 28th of 41 is when the village of Mogador, the Suffield Township trustees, and the Randolph personnel sat down and discussed it, and they split up Suffield Township. Congress Lake Road, the east side, and Congress Lake Road went to Randolph for fire protection. The west side of Congress Lake Road and the rest of Suffield Township was under the jurisdiction, if you will, of the Mogador Fire Department. And generally what they would do is they would charge Suffield Township $40 for a fire call. Is how that kind of worked. <clears throat> but if, if you look, think back, what happened in December of 41? Pearl Harbor, all right? Now, I cannot say with all certainty but based upon this definition I'm going to read here, it's here behind me. This is right from the original minute book of where they organized the fire department. Meeting called for a purpose of civilian defense. Township trustees appointed heads of the different departments. They were to put, put on a group to be voted on and approved. Russ Denny was appointed and approved to organize the fire department. January 21st. The 27th, the meeting was called to order with 73 men from our township showing up. We want to be a part of the fire department. So there was a motivational thing here called Pearl Harbor. It was probably driving this whole event. And I say probably, I can't say with all certainty, it wasn't there. But as you see, Bill Thomas was elected fire chief, Russ Denny. A lot of you know Russ Denny. He was a custodian up at the school. That's my first contact with Russ. Uh, Joe Bowen was Johnny Bowen's brother. And I might also throw in here a couple words that in the 40s, and Jeff, maybe you can help me, the term of uh, Mr. Woolen, Township Trustee, you remember right off the top of your head? In that frame, 30s, 40s, John F. Woolen was a Township Trustee. Pretty certain that's John L. Woolen's father. So I can just imagine, as his time was progressing, come on, Dad, you got to give us some more money. <laughs> and think of all of the boys. All of the Woolens, with the exception of... Um, I'm drawing a blank on his name. Somebody help me. Francis? Francis. Everyone else, all the other Woolen boys were on the fire department. And Francis was the last surviving one. <laughs> so there's a little thing, a little message for you there. So this, this is the one that would drive home by point. Chief Thomas brought up the fact that the new volunteer fire department should set itself as a permanent organization to do all we can to secure adequate equipment to use it to the best of our ability for the protection of persons and property against fire and bombings. Hmm. Or any other such emergency that might arise. 
So they created this list of 73 names, gave it to the township clerk, Wilson Weary, and he submitted it to the county uh, civilian defense to have on record. So that's why I'm surmising December 7th of 41 was instrumental in the formation of this organization. That's my own speculation. Now, the reason I'm throwing these slides up here with dates across the top, I'd like you to pay attention and notice how rapidly, how frequently they were having organizational minute, or meetings. Many times, several times a week. So we're going to try and pay attention to that as we go through here. But February 11th, Kids Fire Chief Bob Clark came down and talked to the crew about the equipment that they would need. Brimfield's Fire Chief Cook came and talked to them about problems that he had, that they had starting their fire department. Kind of, hey, don't make these same mistakes that we made. February 16th, four days later, they met with the trustees and discussed financing, probable cost. It was estimated that $4,075 would be needed, and that's roughly $63,473 today. Which, today I'm going, mm, I don't think so. We could, I don't think we come close, but just to give you a comparison, 42 to uh, 17. Now, where I got those figures, there's an inflation calculator on the internet, and that's where I came up with these figures. Two days later, met with the trustees to find out that the county, or found find out that the county could not help them finance the beginning of this organization. The 25th, the county prosecutor was here to explain to them the, all the legal ramifications, everything they had to know about organizing the department and maintaining the equipment. He told them to fund it, you'll have to come up with the cash or put on a bond issue. Nobody here wanted a bond issue. That's the last thing that they wanted to hear about. So I'm talking to members of the fire department that, that signed up here. So Trustee Weary was at this meeting and he told the fire department personnel that the township was in a position to front them $4,000 to get the fire department started. After that, the budget for quite a while, and I can't tell you how long, they funded them $1,000 a year. But $4,000 to get it started. So, the members at this meeting, <coughs> February 25th, decided that they would canvas the township to get subscriptions from the residents to pick up the rest of the money that they needed to start. Uh, $7 was raised at that meeting, uh, $377 was pledged, Goodyear Tire gave a $500 contribution which would equivalent to $7,500 in 2017, and that was in March or April that they provided that donation to get this started. March 4th of 92, uh, meeting, now notice here where their 73 number dropped to. Now, I'm going to refer to this over here multiple times tonight. That's about where our number stands today. And through the years, that number of personnel has gone like this, up and down and up and down. But we're right around the 30 mark. But at any rate, uh, they opened the meeting. A resolution was passed uh, by the membership that uh, says, We, the volunteer firemen of Suffield Township, Portage County, do set up do hereby set ourselves up as a permanent organization and do all we can to secure adequate equipment to use it to the best of our ability for the protection of persons and property against damage by fire. There's that big bombing word again. Or such emergencies as may arise. Now I'm here to tell you, let's jump up to 2017 now. Not interested in going to a bombing. <laughs> I'm just saying I can't answer for the rest of my people in the room. All right. So they started talking about a building. They needed a building uh, to house the fire truck. So they went to Peninsula, Stowe, and Hartville, and these are the sizes of the fire stations that those municipalities had. So Suffield Township decided, well, we can't be uh, over, we can't underperform here. So the, the reality is they went with 25 and a half feet by 37 and a half feet, so it's slightly larger than the peninsula. <laughs> so, now you in the historical society, that's the north two bays that you have with your building is the original two bays of the fire station. Now, as luck would have it, I have a photo of that coming up here at some point. 
Another interesting thing I found as I was going through this is there's a note that the county, Portage County, took over Wingfoot Road, which was known as Township Highway 6, in 1942 due to the need to build access to the blood panger because of the Navy and their activity and their interest in what was going on with the blimp hanger. March 18th, you notice in how quick, rapidly succession these meetings are. They discuss the finances and they re uh, had a report from Chief Clark from Kent was uh, compiling a list of equipment that he thought that they needed baseline stuff to get the fire department started. March 25th, Commander Knox of the U.S. Navy was in attendance at a meeting. These meetings were held in the town hall. Uh, there was mention that sometimes there wasn't heat in the town hall. They would go to somebody's house or something like that. But uh, interested, the Navy was there. Uh, they had a large investment in the township of Wingfoot Lake. So they had a, a strong interest in what was happening here because they wanted to protect uh, what was going on down at the hangar. Now, this is a resolution passed by the Suffield Township Trustees, March 27th, 1942. And this is copied right out of the Township Minute Book. A resolution was received by Mr. Woolwind, Francis, er, John, uh, John F., uh, trustee, on March 25th, whereby certain residents of Suffield Township whose names appear on said resolution forming themselves into a company which they have named the Suffield Volunteer Fire Department for the purpose of protecting persons and property against damage by fire, bombings, or other emergencies. Moved by Woolwind, second by Ruggles, that this resolution be accepted and that this group be recognized as the Suffield Volunteer Fire Department and entitled to such consideration as the trustees may see fit to grant. <clears throat> and that vote went uh, Woolwind, yes, Ruggles, yes, Shanna felt, yes. A second one was, in accordance with a section of the revised code, effective August, uh, it was moved by Ruggles, second by Shanna, that, that William Thomas be appointed chief of the Suffield Town Volunteer Fire Department, and that was also voted and approved. So there it became official in township document. So this is kind of law, if you will, because it was passed as a resolution by the township trustees. Uh, March 30th, more about the finances. April 1st, report the prosecutor approved the specs for the equipment that the men were wanting and the truck and that advertisements for bids would be out the next two weeks. It sounds like a happy little story so far, doesn't it? <laughs> There's always a big but that comes in here. Uh, April 15th, they were looking at trucks starting to salivate, as I can tell you we do whenever we start talking about a new truck. Discussion of equipment and looking at photos of the trucks. They actually went to Solon uh, on a several occasions to look at a Buffalo fire truck that Solon had. Solon Fire Department took it out, drafted with it, pumped, let them look it over. That's what they wanted. April 18th, 1942, trustees opened those bids, but none were accepted at that time. Well, that's pretty much standard fare because you do need to review them, make sure people are compliant. April 28th, they signed a contract with Buffalo Fire Appliance Company in amount of $6,701, which would be $104,376 today. For that truck and the equipment, with it, here's, here's the but. With a condition that we get a priority 2A rating within 60 days. <coughs> everything went to the war effort. They, were very, they did not let loose, especially the steel. Everything went to the war, war effort. So May 13th, so we're here April 28th, they're, they're moving right along. People are picking up the torch and they're running with it. Here, May 13th. Clerk, Mr. Weary read a letter from the War Production Board from Washington, D.C., dated May 5th of 82. Gentlemen, reference your application for preference rating, a copy of which is enclosed. We regret that we are unable to recommend the issuance of a rating in view of the critical material involved for victory or a maverick chief of the Bureau of Government requirement. Do you think that that took the wind out of their sails? You bet you did. I can tell you what we haven't been able to pull stuff off that we've been wanting to do here. You're so determined, you can taste of that you can taste a victory on a project, and these guys are just blown out of the water right here. But these original, there's another but. These guys were so determined in their effort, they did not give up on that, 
Chief Thomas checked with the Goodyear Fire Chief Mason to see if there's anything Goodyear could do back through the blue panel with the Navy. Chief Mason said, there's nothing else I can do. A letter was then written to the Honorable Dow Harder, representative of the 14th District in Washington. By golly, you go to your congressman, you get things done, right? <laughs> Now, I threw this in here, June of 1942, in the minute book of the Township Trustees, they received a bill from the Brimfield Fire Department for $40 for a fire that occurred at the Woolwind property. Doesn't say what the fire was, grass, house, barn, car, tractor, pony, I don't know. <laughs> it, it doesn't mention what the fire was, but they received a bill for $40. So, the Ann Randolph was there as well. So the trustees looked at the bill for Broomfield and said, this is an illegal bill. We don't have a contract with you and did not pay it. <laughs> so I thought, <laughs> Now, June 30th, this is where these, another butt comes in. Mr. Weary, this will acknowledge receipt of your communication May 20th with regard to your application for a preference rating for one 500-gallon Triple combination fire apparatus. I just talked with the Honorable Maury Maverick, Chief of the Bureau of Government Requirements, and he informs me that the word he sent you is what I told you before. Basically, I told them no. <laughs> it's basically what this letter says. In view of the Goodyear Aircraft Wingfoot Lake Air Dock and its importance, I wish it were possible to get them back of this movement of yours. I will attempt again to get a rating if it is at all possible and as soon as there are some changing conditions with regard to the critical materials involved, with kindest regards, I am yours very truly, Dow Harder. So by golly, Congress gets stuff done for you, right? So now, uh, let's see here. Okay, June, now, can they go to June of 42 to November of 43? <clears throat> I think the group was a little discouraged, quite understandably so. Now, this also does not mean that they were not meeting in that time, but there is no documentation, no minutes of any meeting. But I can tell you, one and all, that group was discouraged. They started talking about equipment again because they got their 2A rating. They had to apply for another 2A rating to build the building. And the truck was housed over Harry Miller's for a time. November of 40, well, that's supposed to be 1943. <laughs> wow. We shot back in time. <laughs> <laughs> now, they called them weather outfits. We today call it turnout gear. But their weather outfits were ready to ship, and they started training in 1943. Now, these are some minute notes out of the Towns of Trustees logs, out of their records. June 27, 42, they got the A2 rating. Prosecutor told them they needed to rebuild, rebid the project. They did get three bids on that project. They accepted a bid, uh, 5,096, but that was for no chassis. The fire department had to supply the chassis for that first fire truck. It was a used chassis. The contract was awarded for the fire truck in September of 42. November 27th, the township received notification, hey, that's a real nice chassis you sent us, but you can't put 500 gallons on it, it won't support it. We can only put a 200 gallon water tank on that. So, what I'm, what I'm here to tell you, just as a comparison, uh, that 200 gallons of water in a 75 gallon minute pump, our grass fire truck would outperform that. From, you know, we carry 200 gallons of, on our grass fire truck, and we have a 250-gallon minute pump on the grass fire truck. They paid for the truck, so the truck came in here. There's no formal declaration, hey, we received the truck today. But they paid for it April 27th of 43, so it's right around that time frame when that truck came in. And May 27th of 43, they canceled the fire contracts, effective July 3rd of 1943, with Randolph and the village of because the volunteer firemen uh, told the trustees that they were confident that they could deal with it, like, quote, unquote. Uh, August 28th of 43, uh, they got their rating to build the building. They had one bid from the Mogador Lumber Company. Any of you have been in the area for a long time? 
I had never heard of the Monitor Lumber Company until I was reading the minutes. They got one bid of $1,700 for those two bays of that building. September 15th, and I had never heard of this before, September 17th, two days later, they called a meeting at the Monitor Lumber Company. They were all there, called the call to order by John Woolen. They actually had a formal meeting at the Monitor Lumber Company to discuss that building. And in December 43, they moved that truck into the new building. Now, fundraising has always been an important part because remember, uh, they didn't get much financial support. It, it was amazing to me, understandable, but amazing to me, the amount of money that went into the roads because we really didn't have roads. A lot of money went to Harry Miller for grading and hauling in gravel. You can see that in the, the uh, ledger of the town's meetings every month. So it was. It was you don't think about it because you drive down a pretty good road today. But think about it when they were building them. You cut up through a yard or you know, a field and you, there's a road and you've got to keep dumping the gravel to it and grading it. it. It's something to think about. So the fire department people had tons and tons of fundraisers. That's the only way they were going to survive. The very first fundraiser that was held for the volunteer fire department was put on a play put on by the Velvet Curtain Players. They made twenty dollars on March seventh of nineteen forty-two, and that was held in the, the town hall. Uh, chicken dinners were very prevalent in the forties. There was discussion on if they wanted to buy the kid, the uh, chickens ready to fry, or wanted to bring in the live ones and, and, and slaughter them here. So, steak dinners were very popular. And that was Bob Longbottom's forte: the steak dinners in the eighties. 70s and 80s, 70s and 80s. Uh, beef suppers, fish fries, pancake breakfast started in the 80s, evolved into a breakfast buffet. We would have, can I say we, because now I'm getting into my watch, uh, eight to 10 fundraisers a year. It was all food related. Uh, other uh, fundraisers were sub sandwiches, rummage sales, craft bazaar, hot dog sales, car wash, salad supper, taco supper, chili supper, forget you name it. Bingo with the BFWs. You could eat it, they wouldn't compare it. <laughs> they did a carnival with the JCs in August of 67. They had a community Halloween party, turkey shoot. They would burn grass for a fee. And they would also haul water during times of drought. People's cisterns at their house would dry up. And they would haul water for $3 a load, $5 a load, something like that. So that's how they got their money. Now what, what I'm doing here is I'm comparing then and now throughout here. So now we're into the call volume. There's not a real solid uh, mention of uh, call volume in any minutes or anything prior to 66. Chief McCabe started a uh, blog. Looks like it was a book that came from the fire marshal's office. And you put all of your activity in this log. So in 1966, you can see the call volume that the Suffield Volunteer Fire Department had coming down through here. Now, this year, in 2017, we had 109 calls as of February 15th. So this is year totals, just as a comparison to you. And you can see through the years how the calls have steadily gone up. Last, uh, last year, we had 743, which was an all-time high for our fire department. Uh, they bought the siren that sat on top of the town hall for so many years in 1944. Uh, that was controlled at the Suffield Inn and in the fire station. Do you remember where else that was? The siren, do you remember where else that was run? That's the only two places I know of. Um, on the roof of the uh, town hall. Right. Oh, yeah, I know. Right. We took that down off the town hall when it needed to be rebuilt one time and ended up putting it up on the host tower for easier access to it. Uh, we had that siren. That siren worked until uh, 2009. It wasn't designed to do the tornado warnings. And one of the trustees was standing with me when we, it was uh, that day in April or March or April, when we set the uh, siren off for the, town, the tornado warning. And the thing just, <laughs> it, it died in 2009. And it had been rebuilt several times through the years, so uh, it, it was an old piece. I'm going to show you something here in a minute. Uh, Communication-wise, the fire department, when you joined the fire department, maybe Pat can attest to this some, they uh, programmed your telephone, even back then, 
it would have a special ring, go ring, 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 and you knew there was a call that came in. Uh, with, for the fire department, you'd pick up that phone, and you heard there was a call, and then you would respond to that. What's that? Right? That's, that, that's the way that worked. Okay. Yep, yep. Now, as, as I've learned through some research here, uh, EMS wasn't a real popular thing here with the firemen when it started here. Uh, some guys kind of didn't like it too much. Uh, but they were received on a telephone, and then a dispatcher, a telephone operator, would go down the list and call until they got three people that could go to the ambulance call. The first radio system was purchased in 1969. We went on the county fire band for you guys, 154.13. Um, and they didn't want to alert the EMS calls on that radio for some reason. I don't know. Um, in 73, they started to do that. Uh, some of the telephone operators we had were, I can't think of Richard Smith's wife's name. Uh, Smitty's wife did it for a while. Judy Stevens, Mildred Steffi, Dolores Klepper, and Marilyn Turner were some of our uh, more prevalent and long-term dispatchers. We had some other ones through the years, but they didn't last near as long as these ladies did. Uh, we moved our dispatching uh, to a communication center in Stark County in January of 1999. There's the card that came with that siren that was on top of the town hall. I still have that in my desk for some unknown reason. I just like to look at it every now and again. It brings back the memories. But you can see the date. I don't know if this is the date of manufacture, date of sale, but uh, November of 44. So, compared a little bit about costs, uh, they bought 13 coats, 16 hats, we call them helmets now, five pairs of boots, paid $887 in 1970. For us to buy that same 13 coats and all that today, it would be $17,847. You think the price of that's gone up just a skosh? <laughs> but I'm also going to tell you the protection that we have in our equipment is second to none. Guys that are here from the fire department, we're talking the coats similar to what's in the display case over here versus what we have now. If they bought a, do a dozen pair of gloves in 1970, $22. That same dozen, 540 today. <clears throat> Parades. Went to a lot of parades through the years, Seabree, Navarre, Stowe, East Sparta, Canal Fulton, North Industry, Canton Township, Beloit, Brimfield, Modward, Brady Lake. Um, that kind of started on my watch. We, had a, we were in the Modward Parade one year and had a house fire in Spring Valley. There was another time we were at the Stowe Parade and had a grass fire. And we had the grass fire truck in that Stowe Parade. When the torch was handed, I should keep saying it's the torch, it's not a good thing. <laughs> the baton was handed to me. Uh, I thought about that and I thought, you people are paying for that stuff to be here to serve you. And so I stopped all this and we'll, we'll go to an adjoining uh, communities parade because we can still get that piece of the equipment back here for you, for your need, but we won't go any further than that. Now, that complicates things. If you wonder why we don't have any more fire trucks than we do, anymore. It's because these fire departments have to pay their guys overtime to go to a parade. You think about it, full-time fire departments, they are not allowed to take that equipment out. They have to pay overtime, and they will not do that. Who would do that? So that's why you don't see more trucks here than, than what you do. It's, it's, a, it's a monetary thing. So a lot of projects and advancements uh, that have occurred here. Uh, in 87, we started our dry hydrant program. We currently have eight of those uh, throughout the township now. That's a pipe that goes out in the lake, and we can go up to it and draft water out and refill tankers. Uh, we only had three water sources in the 70s. Well, through the 70s. Uh, the cistern, we had a cistern, an underground water tank here in the town hall yard, held 10,000 gallons of water. That rusted out. We went to draft out of that one time, and it was empty. Whoa! Now, the neat thing about the cistern was the rainwater came off the town hall, went into a filtering system, and then flowed into that tank. So we had really nice water in that tank as long as it held it. But when it failed, it wasn't worth replacing that. So then we were uh, 
limited to Tullinai Monarch, and then the Blimp Hangar was another place we would go for water. But uh, the dispatch would have to call and say, hey, we have a fire, can you open the gate so we could get in to truck water. Uh, we got we have park monitors, uh, probably 84, 80, 80, no, 83, 84 is when we got our first park monitor. And these things are so sophisticated now. Uh, we can do 12 lead EKG, we can take your blood pressure, we can do capnography, we can see how much oxygen is going through your blood. We can see a percentage of carbon monoxide in your blood. What did I miss, guys? That's all. That's all. <laughs> So the technology is just rampant, and we're getting it and serving you with that. Drug therapy started in 84. In the last 24 hours, I think we've had uh, two overdoses. You know, do I need to mention heroin to you? Uh, and Narcan. But we started with the stuff that can help you. You know, there are people in this room that have benefited by the drug capabilities that we have. We can administer you, give you that same care in your house as you're getting in the hospital emergency room. And that's been a slow evolution through the years. We can activate a STEMI team to the hospital. We're on the phone with them. The hospital is seeing what your heart's doing before you get there. That is some really nice technology. Respiratory treatments. There's a respiratory treatment given today. A gentleman could hardly gasp it so hard for air. Mr. Morrison back here uh, gave him the treatment. By the time they got in the hospital, he was, oh. So the amount of care that we can give you nowadays is just unbelievable. Cabs, the compressed air foam system. We have, have I guess we still have it, a fire truck that uh, can <coughs> shoot compressed air foam out. So we're not 100% dependent upon water. We use less water, do less water damage in your house and that foam soaks in to the nooks and crannies into the carbon material and helps keep that stuff from burning, helps to extinguish it. So that's the technology we have. And our water movement should have been tied in with the dry hydrants that goes with that. Uh, the VFW bought us our dump chute, our dump valve that went in the back of our old 68 tanker. Fred Begg put that in for us and we got into that about 84, 85 and rapidly uh, got into the dumping of water and shuttling water. And what we do is we dump it out of the tanker into a portable tank, and we can use that water while that tanker's going back getting more water. So it speeds up that process. And then we have the automatic aid, and we, we can get a lot of water in here. Now, I'm going to talk about the buildings a little bit. We talked about Station 1. When I talk about Station 1, I'm talking about the building that the Historical Society is in right now. That's what, I, that's what we here refer to as Station 1. Uh, they moved into that December of 43. It had 956 square feet when they moved in there. They had an addition in 1951 uh, where they added the upstairs in two bays, the, the uh, southern bays. In that building for 28 years, I'm sure when they especially when they put that addition on, hey, we're good to go. We're going to be here a long, long time. Because I've been a part of that mentality. But the building got crowded. So they had to go build a new one. So they talked about Station 2, which is the parking lot area there now. And there was a big discussion on where to put it. Where the United Church of Christ is sitting right now, that property had been offered as a donation to the township as a place to put their fire station. A lot of discussion, a lot of debate on what was the best thing. They were concerned about pulling out an emergency scene and the volunteers responding in there. Uh, they need a traffic light there. If they built it here, they'd be taking parking away from the town hall, which was pretty sacred ground at the time. And they, you know, there's parking across the street uh, at 43 there too for a while for the town hall. So, we all know what happened. It was built there, and it cost us $72,434. But, um, that was just for the shell, the wiring, and the plumbing. The volunteers um, finished that building. They painted it. They hung the drywall. They put down the floors. Coming up here, Goodyear supplied them with all the floor tile for that building. Schumacher Lumber gave them the drywall and the wood trim for around the windows and things so that the volunteers could finish that building up 
And then they moved in there December 29th of 71. Now keep in mind, any of you that remember Station 2, they were through three drive through bays. Very comfortably put six vehicles in there. We had seven in a trailer in there on occasion of eight. So when they moved in there with four trucks, don't you think they're thinking, oh my gosh, this is a castle. Absolutely. They had a lot of room. They had room they didn't ever have before. So it was a wonderful feeling. We know that because that's what happened here. But as time goes on, the evolution goes, uh, you run out of room. Bill Stevens uh, put the host tower on station two, created that. He uh, got the money to do that. He got a lot of donations. I don't remember what the cost was, but that was Bill Stevens' project. There's a plaque hanging inside the building uh, commemorating all the donations and uh, Bill Stevens for that project. Uh, we put the pitched roof on that because that flat roof always leaked uh, from day one. They actually held the bond for a while until the STAM construction company came and patched the roof yet again. So we put that on in 86 and squared off the front office. And those of you remember, it was at an angle. We never could understand why somebody would do that because there was so much useless space there in that front. But it was a nice looking building. Uh, several remodels of the interior and the office space through the years. <coughs> that was about 7,200 square feet over there. You're now sitting in Station 3. We started talking about renovating Station 2 in 2003. We hired an architect in, 90, er, in 2004. <laughs> the original plan, I think that's right there, we were going to add another bay to the west, and the offices and personal space would, would come over this way. That was the original plan, the original intent. And the office uh, space that was existing on the east side would turn into functional areas, uh, laundry, uh, a workroom, and supply rooms, things like that. They were going to tear off the back wing, the back addition we had put on in part of the front and kind of square that up. But that was the plan originally to do with uh, the building renovation. We had an assessment done. They showed a lot of water damage. The host tower was actually leaning away from the building. I never even noticed it until I was in there with the architect. He said, look at the crack, how it's small here. And you look up, you can see the light coming through. It's leaning. I went, ah. <laughs> so that was a problem. So to do all of this, uh, the architect told us that they tell you to build new when you reach 60% of the cost to, uh, to do that. We were at 78% of the cost of new to renovate. So they said, absolutely not. We were going to end up having like two walls left and starting over from that. So it was determined that it was kind of dumb to do that. We moved in here December 6th of 2010. And the building was dedicated. Public dedication was held uh, November 14th. Now I want to talk about our fire chiefs here. Bill Thomas. The first one served for 23 years. He was also the Township Justice of the Peace for a couple of years. Did anybody here know Bill Thomas? Did you? I, I got to know his wife a little bit. They lived right across the street from the fire station, but I did not know him at all. I know his granddaughter pretty well. There's Chief McKay. He was chief for seven years. Chief Metal was here for four years in that capacity. He was here with the department longer than that, but he was served as chief for four years. Uh, chief uh, Stevens was only able to serve one year. He had a heart attack, and his health did not permit him to continue in the capacity. Uh, and then Chief Woolen was here in chief capacity for six years. He was one of the founding members, and it's one of the ones that Gina was talking about. He's one of the biggest guys that uh, had big influence on me and uh, honored to have known him and served with him, worked with him. Um, and he served assistant chief for uh, many years you know, throughout the, the time frame too. And then I've been here in this capacity uh, for 33 years. So I'm the winner! <laughs> so, now I want to talk about the personnel. This photo was taken, I'm going to tell you what this photo was taken for. Uh, my father passed away in 2012, Memorial Day weekend of 2012, and Mom and I asked,
for the group to get together for family portrait. I had to make, talk to one person, and they made all these phone calls to all these people, and they all came in here out of respect and love for my mother and me. So when you become a part of this organization, you become a very tight-knit family. Uh, Becky is one of our explorers. She's one of our family. Ryan is an explorer. He's one of our family. And you, you can't lose the title. You always are. Now, just like any family, sometimes we scoff, so we squabble. But woe be any of you that try to pick on any of our people. You're going to have a, a, a big herd coming after you. <laughs> we're, we're very protective of each other. And uh, it's a very special bond that holds all of these people together. Now, <clears throat> I do want to comment on this a little bit. If you're going to be sick, if you're going to have a heart attack, or a stroke, or a major trauma, now's the time to do it. These are the people. The people that are serving you today are so highly skilled when they come out of school. They have so many resources and so much technology at their fingertips. Now let's jump back to your heart attack of that in the 40s, 50s, 60s, even into the 70s. Not a good thing. Your outcome wouldn't have been near the same as it is today. Right, Gino? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and I said that at one of your meetings when you were promoting the firehouse. Yes. Uh, Gino's one of our poster children. Uh, he crashed right as we got him into the ER. But the drug therapy that he had made a lot of difference. Uh, now, conversely, those people that started this place in 1942 had nothing but their words to start the place. That's all they had was words. All of us have been given building, equipment, leadership. Those guys didn't have any of that. So I think if we're going to talk about personnel, the people that we need to be really put up and honoring here are the people that started it, because they had nothing. They were denied at a federal level twice. They persisted. They kept going. If you wanted to have something happen, if you wanted to build a truck, that's the time to do that in the 40s, the 50s. Herm uh, Paulus, all that he did, he built several of the trucks, and you, in the minute you read about the guys going over there to help put the thing together. So the dynamic has changed. Now, let me tell you, don't ask these guys to build your truck. It's not, <laughs> a not a good thing. We can figure it out. <laughs> You're going to lose your car if you read the manual. <laughs> but the dynamic's different. These people are specialists, and they're very good at what they do. But I'm really honored to, for the moment, and that's what it is. Every job you have is temporary. My position here with Southern Township is temporary. But for the time being, I am so blessed to have had a relationship with these people and to currently have a relationship that I do have with these people. I am truly blessed to call these people family. Staffing, uh, I don't remember what year they started doing a weekend thing because it was always a free-for-all. And we still do that. And we have what's called a general alarm. If we have a car crash or any type of fire, if you're available, we want to see you. So that hasn't changed. We still need to see you. Uh, the first women were brought into the fire department uh, in 76, but they were stripped purely for uh, EMS purposes. Uh, I was the first full-time chief in January of 90. Uh, I, again, I started in 84 for Johnny, after Johnny. But uh, We started putting part-time people in here from 12 to 5 in 1994. We had three people that ran during the day. Vern Holmes, uh, Dolores Klepper, and Paula Coltrone. And it was not fair to those people to expect them to show up here from 6 in the morning to 6 in the evening, Monday through Friday. At some point, you got to go to the store. At some point, you got to go to the doctor's office. We just did not, we ran out of people willing and able to serve. And I say able. This job isn't for everybody. We see some pretty nasty things sometimes. 
Uh, we pushed that out from noon to 6 uh, later in 94. We went to 6 to 6. You see how this is evolving here. June of 99, in the summer months, we pushed that uh, out to 9 o'clock at night. And when you're here, you get a quicker response out of us. We started a rapid responder program January 10th, 2000. What that was is we bought a uh, Ford Explorer, uh, put some fire extinguishers in that vehicle, and a lot of medical equipment, and we would be out. Uh, Tim Hinkle is my poster child on that rapid responder program. He was out uh, at a house on May Road one night, had an IV started, the patient was hooked to the heart monitor, and was administering some medication going before the ambulance got there where the two volunteers came in from home to get the ambulance and go. That was a huge difference. Now, it was great sometimes, but stupid people will ruin things for you, so we had to back off of that because uh, our little Lone Ranger going out as the rapid responder, we had situations where they were put in jeopardy. In fact, one night right at the fire station, uh, Keith Imhoff was there, there was a knocking on the door, he went, there was a lady holding a baby, and there was blood all over it, and probably 20 feet behind this lady was her attacker. So he opened the door rapidly, pulled her in, and relocked the door. So it's kind of dangerous having one, anymore, one person by themselves. It's dangerous. Now, <clears throat> talking about people, this is showing a one mile radius of the Suffield Fire Station. This is a list of names of people that lived within that one mile radius. None of these people on that list are on the fire department now. Well, I got retracted. Connie Mahalik is, but she no longer lives in the one mile radius. She moved to Macedonia. We do have one gentleman that just joined with us, lives on uh, South Poland. South Poland, thank you. Our dynamics changed. He had people living right across from the fire station. A call came in, they could get right on a truck and leave pretty quick. I don't have that anymore. We have like six or seven people that live in our township anymore. The dynamic has changed. Now, this chart is showing Personnel. The ones that you see in yellow are still on the fire department. These are the longest serving members in the history of our fire department. And you'll see this top guy here is in red because he is still with us. Robert Dudley, been here 47 years. And he's, I don't want to say he's going strong, but he's still going. <laughs> and then you can see uh, Gord Miller and myself are in here. Uh, Mark Jordan, Connie. Tim Hinkle, Keith, and Matt, who's standing back here in the back. So uh, these are the longest serving people. So as you see, we have people that are still very dedicated for a long, long time to this organization, to our township. So we're very blessed to have them. This is a little chart that I made just to show something here. In 1942 versus 2016, this is the time that a volunteer has available to give to you. You only got so much time. Fundraising was so important, they had to have it, and the effort was huge in 1942. But as time has gone on, that fundraising, now we're still doing fundraising, but it's not as critical, because that's what tax levies are doing. But then the call volume, as I showed you before, and the training that the, I expect out of these ladies and gentlemen that are on the fire department, that has grown. We have a lot of mandates from the state, and we have a lot of in-house mandates. They have a lot of daily responsibilities. So that's just showing, you know, how time is changing different parameters here with our fire department. I have said for some time their primary focus cannot be fundraising. It has to be taking care of you. The primary focus. Now I'm rapidly going to go through our fleet. This is the picture I was going to tell you about. I just happened upon this this afternoon. This is that the original truck. This is the two bay fire station. And you see right here, as I was reading, I can't attest to it other than from the stuff I was reading. This was the township greater shed. 
Prior to these other two bays being built on, there was talk about moving the greater shed and setting it up on the roof for the clubhouse. They called it the clubhouse. So we all know that didn't happen, but yet that was possibility thinking. They were trying to be creative, least expensive route to an end. But that didn't happen. And I look at that truck and I'm just thinking, this one here, I'm just thinking, I just don't know how safe that would have been going down the road. But these guys, these guys were creative and they got the job done. I mean, you can't take that away from them. Oh my goodness, those guys were incredible. Incredible craftsmen. These are the first, uh, see, I don't know if one of these trucks was re -chassied. This is the original truck. I don't know if they took that big monstrosity off and put a different tank on here. I can't answer that question. But I will point out to you, this is before the basement was put in our town hall. So, and this picture would have been taken right around 1951, because that's when they built these other two bays onto the building. And there's those uh, three trucks there after that addition. You see the greater shed's gone. It's not upstairs. This was our very first ambulance that we had. They didn't call it an ambulance. It was an emergency truck. And I thought it was very interesting that uh, in the minutes it said that their very first chainsaw they bought, they put on board this truck. Because it was an emergency truck. It was multifaceted. A lot of the fire departments around us didn't have a means to transport patients to the hospital. So you can read in the minutes where this truck went into uh, Broomfield, Randolph, Hartville, uh, and took people to the hospital. You know, that's in the 60s that that was going on. That's a 1953. We retired that in 1980, and that truck was 27 years old when we uh, retired that. This truck's a 55 white. Uh, ret uh, retired that one in 1985 after uh, 30 years. Uh, Bob got us a bunch of foam from Goodyear. There were all kinds of buckets of foam up in here. And as you see, we kept the boat on top of that truck. Figures from dive truck map. And there's another picture of that truck. Isn't that a nice looking truck? Yeah. I actually tried to track that down to see if we could get it back here for the 75th anniversary this year, but uh, that's a whole other story. Uh, this is the first, uh, what I would call, real fire truck that we had. It was commercially built. Uh, the members didn't build that. It's a 62. Uh, had that one for 32 years. You see, we keep our assets for quite a while. And there's Bob Dudley, Chief Metal, and Ernie Bianchi standing there by that truck. And that's where we uh, uh, were painting that. We took everything off of it, as you see. Uh, Refurbed that thing, repainted that right there at the other building. And I remember Johnny said to me, he says, there's too much white on that truck. <laughs> but we wanted it to match the other fire truck that we had there, and you'll see in a minute. That's uh, the 1968 tanker when it came in. Uh, <coughs> retired that in 1996. It was 28 years old. And there's the truck with a white roof on it. There's the entire fleet that they had in 1969. Right around 1969. That's our very first commercial ambulance that we bought, uh, 1973. Uh, there was a gentleman that said, hey, we can build an ambulance uh, for about $6,500. So, so there was discussion about that, but they elected to go ahead and go this route. Probably a good thing. Uh, retired as an ambulance in 1989. But we kept it until 92. We used that as a personnel transport vehicle and something else that I've grown very fond of. When we're out and we have spaghetti that I call fire hose laying all over your yard, axes, air packs, everything, we just have all kinds of equipment laying over. It's nice to throw it, not throw it, but put it in a vehicle and bring it back so we can properly clean it and inspect it before it goes back into service. So that's what we started doing with this vehicle as well. And then we have the pickup truck for that purpose now. And there's that, that vehicle hauled a lot of people to the hospital. And there's where we, uh, when we re, uh, gutted it and converted it into the uh, multi purpose vehicle. There's the grass fire truck, 180 gallons of water, had a 10 gallon minute pump. 
we uh, retrofitted that. We had that truck for 28 years. I had some guys tell me today that they preferred that truck over what we have now. That thing worked better off-road than what we've got. Uh, and there's where we renovated and put a utility type body on that truck. We did that here actually. We didn't send that on. <clears throat> there's uh, 97, our first, well, our first diesel vehicle in the fleet. Uh, paid 62, almost $63,000 for that truck. Ordered it in 1974, didn't get it till January 76. Now, uh, that was 28 years old. The thing that I've always said about that truck, I've always said that was a very stupid truck. <laughs> because it didn't know if it was pulling a hill or going down a hill. It didn't know if it was being abused. It didn't care. It just kept running. It kept doing its job. That thing was abused through the years, and it just kept a smile on its little bumper there. It just kept kept running like there anything wrong with it. That was a very good truck. Uh, we carried Johnny to his final resting place on that vehicle. Mm -hmm. And that's one of my favorite pictures. That was actually on the community calendar one year. I don't know if anybody remembers what year that was, but they were there with that truck. And uh, that had been in the 90s sometime. When he, that's when we went over to uh, Four Guys to get whatever that was. So that that was a workhorse of the fleet. There's no question about that. That's our uh, next ambulance there, an 1980 wheel coach. Uh, that was in service for 18 years. We sold that to the Sheriff's Department for a uh, county water rescue deal. And there it is in the parade. That's our first medium duty ambulance. That was, we paid $71,000 for that in 1989. Uh, 17 years old when we parted with that. Now this one, this picture, this is the only photograph that I could find of this band. The reason I bring this up, this band was donated to us. My father, I can talk about it now. I wasn't allowed to talk about it. My father was able to get that band from Ohio Edison to donate that minivan to us. So this is actually taken at our 50th anniversary. And if any of you uh, remember what happened on our 50th anniversary, we had a million dollar fire going on right down the road on parade day. So that's a real memorable day for me. Uh, but that uh, Aerostar van was what we had. We had that here for eight years. Uh, there's our rescue pumper that we currently have out on the floor, uh, our current tanker. That's 21 years old now. There's our uh, second medium duty, retired from service in 2012, 15 years. The reason we, we retired that a couple years earlier than what we were going to, because the uh, rules, the terms of uh, requirements for an ambulance were changing. And we wanted to get a hold of the new requirements. We wanted to order before those new laws went into effect. So that's what we did. This, this, I think we saved, we, well, I don't remember, we saved a lot of thousands of dollars by doing that. That was our rapid responder vehicle I was telling you about. We had that here for 16 years. Uh, that is our current grass fire truck, and we also plow snow with that. Probably plow more snow than we put out grass fires with it. And that was another interesting thing, if I can jump back to the 60s, if you track the calls that they had, it's so many grass fires, they were inundated with fires of all kinds of varieties, with just the sprinkling of a, a medical call. And that's just the total opposite now. Total opposite. And there's our uh, main fire truck, our 2003 Pierce, paid $342,000 for that thing. And that truck is now 14 years old. But it is uh, a very, very heavy duty truck. And we're certainly blessed to have that in the fleet and the region. That truck is rated to pump 1,500 gallons a minute, but we uh, did an excess test on it one year, and it pumps uh, 20, over 2,200 gallons a minute. If you, can, if you can get the water to it, it'll move it. <laughs> and there's that truck. That's probably not long after it came in. And there's the two trucks. You can see how much bigger this one is compared to that one, the sister that it replaced. And that's just a generational shot, you know, one, two, three, as we've gone through the time there. 
That's uh, our current ambulance. Uh, we had it re in 2011. It's a 2006, but we had a lot of problems with that uh, and re that to get away from that uh, Ford 6 liter. Anybody familiar with that? There's our pickup truck. There's our other ambulance, which is pretty much an identical ambulance to the other one. And it works nice for these guys and gals when they're out on a med run. You don't have to think, where is that piece of equipment on this truck? They're both identically outfitted, equipped, in locations 99.9%, .9%, everything's in the exact same place. And that's uh, the fire chief vehicle that's used for running errands. And uh, part of the reason we got that in 2010, my license plate was run on several calls that we had. I was standing next to a sheriff's deputy up here on uh, Waterloo Road, and I heard, that comes back to a Robert Rajdick on Chief of Road, and my head cranked around. I said, what's up? He said, well, I know whose car this is, because it was unmarked, no lights or siren on it, and I'm sitting there on a scene. State Patrol has run it multiple times out on car crashes. So he said, we got to do something here with my license. <laughs> so that's part of the reason. Uh, actually, the other explorer fit that bill first, and then that. So, I want to thank you for your time, and I hope that you learned something from this. I sure did. Uh, I appreciate the assignment. And I want to bring up one other thing. I don't know how many of you saw the newspaper. There was quite a tribute to our, our lovely Judy Kelsey in the newspaper not too long ago here. Yes, it was a wonderful tribute to you. Well, what an educator you must have been. So, I'm going to clap for you. Bob, are you willing to take some questions? Yes, oh, absolutely. Questions, yes. <laughs> Nobody has any. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, well, that's such a good job. Well, I, I have a, a question. Yeah. You, you've been such a professional, I have to say. We're so fortunate to have.